somebody like Bonnard is consistently good. He continues to, although he's no more innovative in that sense, but he has this kind of toolkit of dots and, and uh, uh, vibrant colors and things like that, and he fashions every time, every painting, he fashions something new that is absolutely riveting for those who are so inclined. Um, uh, Gauguin is the same case. And then most of the other people of that same generation, they are, they're nothing. They just have one moment, one blip. Matthias Vasek, PhD, is the C. Jean and Miles McDonough Director of the Worcester Art Museum. Matthias Vasek, PhD, became Director of the Worcester Art Museum in November 2011. Originally from Germany, Dr. Vasek wrote his doctoral thesis on French art theory at the end uh, of the end of the 19th century, which encompasses thinking about the fine and decorative arts, as well as architecture and literature in a globalizing world. This painting by Pierre Bonnard, Dining Room in the Country, is from 1913 and is at the Minneapolis um, uh, Institute of Art. I don't know if you have that in your lives. Um, a moment spent with an artwork, maybe not the original, just a reproduction, and it just went through you like a, like a thunder or like a whatever. Um, I had that when I was 16 years old, and this basically set me on the, on the trajectory of becoming an art historian. I didn't quite know where my job would end up. I didn't even know that the city of Worcester existed then. <laughs> I knew that there was a source, but that was more in England. So um, what happened was, and this is in the time which dates me very much, obviously, um, uh, in the time before, we had unlimited access via the internet to visual information. So where did you go? You went to libraries or to bookshops. And so one of the most wonderful moments when I was 16 was when I could sneak from this slightly banal uh, um, uh, suburb of Bonn into the, the center of the city. And I went to this bookstore called Bouvier, and they had this big art section, and I just went browsing. Um, there were lots of people who went browsing, uh, and every now and then there was a scolding uh, uh, book dealer who said, you have to buy the books, and then we just kind of put the books aside, and, and then we came back. So, um, and I opened one of those books, and there was this painting, and I thought, this is absolutely amazing. And you would see the original, obviously, because these uh, uh, colors here uh, on, the, on the projection uh, don't do it justice at all. Um, and... What makes, makes it amazing is very much, of course, your, your, your personal taste, but it's also the taste of the time. So um, I was 16 in uh, 77, I think, must have been then. So um, that was the time when in Germany, probably in America, the same thing, you had everywhere these psychedelic colors. Uh, there were these posters. I still remember a poster with Angela Davis on it. Um, and there, was lots, there were lots of psychedelic colors behind her. Um, and this is a very tame version thereof. And actually, I like that tamer version much better than those psychedelic colors. But I was primed for that. And um, my liking of this painting actually um, uh, uh, was following a, a trend. So these paintings didn't have that much of a market value in the 1960s. It started in the 1970s, along with that new taste uh, um, for dealing with colors and, and for dealing with surfaces um, that painters like uh, uh, Pierre Bonnard uh, actually uh, became uh, very much of a fixture uh, on the uh, art market. So um, what is so um, interesting about it? I mean, everybody finds their own interest in the painting. So I give you just what I think is interesting and uh, a lot of other art historians think so, but that's just us. You may find uh, other things. So, Look at this painting, it's, it's, um, uh, very, it's, it's a combination of a lot of forms. So you have, and I hope I can do this this way, yes. So you have a round form here, there you go. You have a rectangle there. You have another rectangle down there. You have a very thin rectangle here, more rectangles. And then you have amorphous forms. So these, all these forms are together um, on that square of the rectangle, the big rectangle uh, of, uh, of that painting. Um, and then you have colors. And it's the most, most outrageous color combinations uh, that, apart from this psychedelic style uh, that was so much in fashion in the 70s, um, that you can imagine. I mean, 
look at, uh, for instance, at the, the wall under the window, there are two reds. There is a, a, an orangey red, and then there's a crimson red. To put these two together, it kind of vibrates in your eyes, and when you look in, uh, at the original, it does even more so. Uh, look at this pale blue of the door and the orange of the wall. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite a color. Would you ever dress like that? Probably not. Um, because it's, it's too strong. Um, uh, look at all this, this, this tickling uh, of the eye that happens in the background, all these dots. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are some, some uh, 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 pink dots uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Let's go into further detail. So when you look at this, uh, you get some of the, uh, um, some of the um, color combinations so it's either solid colors, like in the case of the, um, uh, of the door with the wall, uh, or you have this, these smaller dots, uh, which are actually the pebbles uh, from the garden outside. Um, and just look at the, the, the combination. There's greens, there's, there's pinks. And then you have this other form on the, on the right-hand side, which is uh, the, uh, the curtain. Um, and it looks like... Um, almost like cut-out shapes uh, that, are, that are kind of coming down from, uh, from the top. Um, so um, this, this painting, and this is, this is going to be the point of what I'm going to uh, walk you through, is basically uh, the summing up of what happened 20 years before in cutting-edge French painting, so around 18... Um, at that same time, however, um, it's, it's, it's already quite conservative uh, for that time, 1913. Uh, uh, At that same time, you have people like Matisse, Picasso, Mondrian, Malevich, who are going already to far different chapters. You have Cubism, uh, you have Fauvism, um, Mondrian, you remember these, these paintings with horizontals and verticals, Malevich, who, who just says, the sun is dead, color is dead, just a big black cross. Um, so that's pretty tame, it's pretty bourgeois, actually. Um, and the, 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 the people who bought this kind of art were pretty bourgeois at the time, and the bourgeois side in, my, in me loves that dearly. So, um, <laughs> where do we start? A lot of things in French painting start with Impressionism. And um, what... Uh, fascinated people so much about Impressionism was that the technique, um, which was very much possible due to the availability of colors in tubes, um, was no more in these layers with varnish, but it was just directly slab on that canvas. And um, what the uh, Impressionists uh, did on top of that was that they were uh, dealing with the surface of the canvas um, by structuring it into different areas of um, uh, 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 brush, uh, uh, brushworks. Um, so take uh, the painting on the uh, right-hand side, which is by Claude Monet, uh, which is from 1878. It's at the Musée d'Orsay, and it's one of the first paintings that I always go to when I go to the Musée d'Orsay. And uh, it is the 14th of July uh, at the Rue Montorgueil. The Rue Montorgueil looks much less uh, fancy than that, um, so he, he, he took some liberties. But that's not the point. So it's this street um, that is completely filled with uh, the, the tricolore, the French flag. Um, and when you look at it, uh, there is some form of initial chaos, but actually it is pretty well structured. So you have, and for me visually, maybe, maybe I go in front of this, can you? Can you? Okay. Um, and I will not jump, I promise you. Uh, so what you have is this triangle, and you have just this kind of, this kind of brushwork. It's just comma that are, that are uh, uh, vertical. And then you have this zone, which has uh, vertical lines, and then you, you have diagonal lines filled into that. And then you have a sky that is yet a completely different brushwork. So you have basically one, two, three, four fields of differentiated, highly differentiated brushwork. And this is what Impressionism was about, among so many other things, that they used um, uh, um, uh, subjects that were not structured at all and made it on that canvas uh, into a structured entity. 
Um, you have the same thing uh, we, uh, on the painting uh, uh, on, the, on the left, uh, one of also my absolute favorites at the uh, Musée d'Orsay. It's called Les Dindons, uh, the turkeys. And when you say in French Dindon, you also talk about people who are kind of waddling. Um, so just imagine. Um, and uh, when you look at this painting, you have again various areas of brushwork. So you have this, um, this S line going through, and the way the brushwork goes is roundish. Okay, here, it's, it's all round. And then this background is mostly vertical lines, and every now and then there's a kind of blue comma that's uh, slightly uh, uh, diagonal. Then you have that upper line, and then you have the sky. So you have different, again, it's, it's this kind of completely unstructured, I mean, this gigantic field, it's not structured at all. It's structured just by virtue of having these theatrically uh, uh, placed uh, waddling dindons uh, there. Um, and then there's far away a house, and yet the whole thing pulls together, just because the brush structure uh, uh, holds that together. And if we go back quickly to our uh, uh, Bonnard, you have different brush structures there as well. It's just uh, not done just with, uh, with comma uh, or with lines. It's done with dots and so many other devices. And we are coming to that in a second or in 20 minutes. So now, um, what the Impressionists also brought uh, to the taste of that younger generation of which Bernard uh, was uh, part of um, is the taste for Japan. Um, and uh, the painting Les Dindons on the left is actually following a Japanese device. So instead of having a, a structured landscape, uh, the way we know it from the old masters, um, you have the most unlikely shapes to give it structure, being the dindon. Um, and it is an S shape that actually leads us into that space. Um, so that's something, these S shapes leading into the depth of the space is something very Japanistic. Um, when you look at the painting on the right-hand side, which is by Vincent van Gogh, no less, uh, from uh, uh, 1887, um, it's a copy of um, uh, a work by Hiroshige, um, you don't have brushwork at all, but you have um, odd shapes that structure that surface. So you have that tree uh, that cuts. You don't even see where the roots are. That just cuts in there. And then you have these other trees. And then you have little kind of reminiscences of Impressionism with these dots over there um, and so on. So um, Impressionism and Japanism go together and this walk together was highly inspiring for future generations. And I'll show you one painting uh, by Vincent van Gogh. It's the Père Tanguy, who was a very legendary art dealer uh, who took paintings in commission for um, colors and then became art dealer. Um, and so you see him sitting there and uh, the whole background is basically compartmentalized spaces, uh, compartmentalized areas of specific brush strokes again, uh, specific brush strokes and specific colors. Uh, so, um, and you have a lot of Japanese subjects uh, there as well. Um, so this combination, um, or this, this, this way of looking at this surface uh, of the painting as being uh, compartmentalizable, if you will, um, being both flat, a surface, but giving also an illusion of depth, and you don't quite know which of the two play. They play at the same time. That was one of those very, very uh, important uh, uh, lessons of uh, Japanism on top of what I, I mentioned, uh, being uh, these kind of uh, very, very exotic ways of, combine, or of uh, composing uh, uh, a subject. So it's at this point, for my taste, uh, that the work of Van Gogh actually gets really interesting. Uh, before the potato eaters, um, and all these kind of brown things, no color, not, nothing at all. Um, and here, there's quite some color, there's quite some, 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 uh, some structure in it. And um, uh, when you now look at the, um, the Bonnard painting, um, and you just bear in mind this idea of compartmentalization of that surface, you have exactly that. 
When you bear in mind this idea of giving uh, an illusion of depth and yet taking it away at the same time, you have it exactly in that, uh, in that Bonnard painting. Um, so there's definitely uh, an important connection. These guys, they talk to one another. So uh, Paris is quite big, but the artist circles, um, they were in cer certain cafes. Uh, they were in certain uh, um, studios uh, that they met. And uh, Bonnard and, and Vincent van Gogh, they, they had quite some, some connections. Um, so let's go to the next one. Now there comes something else into the, um, into the equation. And that is a painter whose name you've never heard, by whom we have a work on view right now in our 19th century galleries, uh, Louis Anquetin. So Louis Anquetin um, was one of those artists at that time uh, that um, were completely tuned in into the avant-garde circles. He was in a studio, so people learned in artist studios. Uh, so this was the Atelier Cormont. One of his colleagues was no less than uh, uh, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, and another of his colleagues uh, was Vincent van Gogh. Um, and they were all just trying out new things. So how can you get from Impressionism to something else? Because Impressionism, being there, done that, that's another generation. When you think about it in terms of marketing, um, there are too many people who are branded with this. If you really want to make your dent, you have to do something else. The American Impressionists, they came much later, so they didn't have that weight on them. But these people in, in Paris uh, had that. And it's this also extremely individualistic climate where you really have to put your stake in the ground and say, hey, that's me. I'm very different from all the others. So they came basically every day with a new manifesto um, of um, a new way, a new technique of making art. And so in 1888, um, Louis Anquetin uh, had a show uh, in one of those uh, uh, highly prestigious among avant-garde people, uh, circles in Brussels, uh, Les Vins. And um, there was, so you have to have an exhibition and you have to have a journalist who speaks about you. And so the journalist in question, uh, um, Camille Mauclair, uh, published uh, in one of those symbolist reviews that were circulated very, very broadly in these avant-garde circles, this is the birth of cloisonnisme. So there are so many isms, impressionism, Cubism later, here we have cloisonnisme. So cloisonnisme, he explained it that way. Um, uh, Louis Anquetin uh, 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 spent his summers with his parents uh, in Normandy, and they had a door with stained glass, and according to the stained glass that he was looking through, um, he would see the world in completely different ways. So if he looked through a, a yellow stained glass, um, uh, it uh, did the following, just a moment. Um, so green glass imitated, uh, just a moment, uh, imitated the light of a full moon, yellow accentuated the radiant power of the sun, and blue gave the impression of snow. So this is how he, how he wrote in this article. And uh, uh, Anquetin did speak with, with uh, Van Gogh. Van Gogh read this, which gave even more validity to, uh, uh, to the art. And so in the fall of that same year, um, when uh, um, uh, Van Gogh went to southern France, he painted the painting on the right-hand side. So normally you would not think that somebody as, as prestigious, uh, as monumental as Van Gogh, would ever copy someone else. Well, he did. Um, and what you have there is a way of dealing with color, of accentuating color, that Impressionism wasn't able to do. And it is in parts by massing the color, but something else comes into that equation too. And that you'll see in the second example. You all know the painting on the right-hand side, probably. Um, you do not know the one on the left-hand side, although you can see one version of it at the Wadsworth Athenaeum uh, uh, in Hartford. And so the painting on the left is called um, Boulevard de Clichy uh, at night. Um, and it's actually in the winter at night, because looking through the blue, you see everything in, in, in winter. So everybody was wearing fur coats. Um, so you can imagine it's, it's pretty cold and quite rainy. Um, Vincent van Gogh makes something very different out of it. In Arles, it's not cold at all. <laughs> um, and it's not rainy at all. You have the most wonderful uh, um, uh, sky. Um, and what sets both, uh, what both also have in common is that um, in addition to this omnipresent blue, 
uh, you have something extremely warm, and it, it rarely comes across as so warm only because of this massing of all this blue and all this yellow and orange. It's just via this contrast that the orange and the yellow um, are glowing. And this is a glow that the Impressionists never got into their paintings, actually. And this is a glow that Bonnach was interested in and that all these new artists uh, uh, around him uh, were very uh, interested in. So, next chapter. Here we are in uh, 1888. So, the, the, the painting uh, on, the, on the right is um, in the fall of 1888. And the painting on the left, as the predecessor, uh, the, the previous one, is um, uh, equally uh, from the summer of 1888. So there's just some months between these two paintings. Um, so that same year, um, another group of artists, uh, again, all related in Paris, all frequenting the same ca uh, cafes, all meeting the Père Tanguy, giving some artworks uh, in exchange for color. So there was a group of painters who, in the summer, fled to Brittany. There were lots of reasons why they uh, left for Brittany. Firstly, Brittany was damn cheap. Secondly, um, there was this mystique um, for people, for city dwellers, that in the countryside, particularly the unspoiled countryside, you would not encounter any traces of industrialism. So there was also some escapist uh, part to it. So the painting on the left-hand side is uh, by uh, Paul Gauguin, um, and he painted that uh, in the summer of that year. And what you see there is, well, our Japanistic tree that goes straight across the painting. Uh, you see some remnants of Impressionist uh, brushwork, but not that much. Uh, and you see this glow of the red coming from the, from the background. So Gauguin, who studied with Camille Pissarro uh, uh, in the Impressionist mode, completely broke away from that um, when he was at that moment in uh, Brittany. And he knew about the paintings by uh, Louis Anquetin, um, probably because he met Anquetin himself, but another person who would have been the go-between was a colleague of Anquetin's in the Atelier Cormont, a certain Emile Bernard, who was the main person in my, 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 my PhD. And so people were talking about this bizarre Paul Gauguin who was a, 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 a stock exchange person who had given everything up, started as a dilettante in Impressionist painting and then turned into a very poor uh, but very charismatic uh, full-time uh, artist. And so there was a gentleman from another artist's studio, the Atelier Julien, um, who also went to Brittany following the mystique and going where life is cheap. And so uh, he knocked at the door uh, of um, uh, Gauguin and said, teach me, teach me your method. Um, so Paul uh, it's Paul Serrusier uh, who did this. And according to the myth, um, Gauguin told him to sit in front of the uh, Pont d'Amour, um, the lake of love uh, in Brittany, uh, and um, put a uh, uh, asked him to paint what he saw. And this poor Cerusier, of course you only see what you know, so to paint what you see, just switching off your brain is impossible. But there's a good way of switching off your brain, according to that myth at least. So uh, Gauguin, uh, who was uh, um, uh, very much in love with arms, put one of the guns to his head and said, if you don't paint what you see, I kill you. <laughs> so. Apparently it worked. So um, what you see there is this, uh, this um, painting. It's, it's, it's done on the back of a cigar box. It's very small. Um, and uh, you have these glowing colors coming out. It's, it's, it's a very modest format. Uh, but all these glowing colors just by contrast and by massing of colors. Um, and he was so proud of this. And he took that back to Paris to his co-students at the Atelier Julien. And here you have, uh, from a much later time, uh, a group painting of these artists. And um, one of them, so first of all, uh, Pierre Bonnard is the second from the right. Okay? So that's the way the man looked, at least at that time, uh, in 1901. Uh, then you have um, a, a person who is uh, slightly behind the easel, 
And that is Maurice Denis, one of these members of that group. And he wrote uh, in um, 1891 yet another of those manifestos. So manifesto after manifesto. His manifesto was Le Manifeste du Neotraditionalisme. And that word was just taken from somewhere to, to say something important. But the sentence that he writes in this uh, manifesto is very interesting. And I'm going to translate this, although I memorized it in French, I'm tra translating this in, in, uh, into English. We always have to remember that a painting, before it is rep representing a still life, um, a female nude or uh, an anecdote, is first of all a flat surface with lines and colors arranged in a certain order. So it's very formalistic. So the way I introduced this talk with this formalistic uh, uh, description of the painting, this is exactly what these guys were after. When you look at that painting, it's, it's, uh, um, you can very easily uh, uh, look at it in a formalistic way. You have this black mass in the center uh, with little, little openings to the, to the bottom and little openings uh, to the top. Uh, you have some color contrasts that are just uh, uh, an idea of, of glowing, like this pink uh, in the inside of the, of the window on the, on the, on the left. Um, and then you have, like in the, uh, uh, the wonderful painting by Vincent van Gogh that I just showed you with the Père Tanguy, you have lots of paintings quoted in there, so different surfaces, again, treated in, in, in different uh, ways. Uh, so um, we made a journey now um, uh, looking af after Impressionism, Japanism, uh, looking at um, the introduction of the glowing color. Look at the glowing beard uh, of the gentleman, uh, the second from the, from the left, that's Paul Ranson. Uh, then another person whose name you may have heard is Ambroise Vollard, uh, who is the man who's hiding behind the easel at the very top. Ambroise Vollard was the first dealer of uh, Picasso. Uh, and he was uh, the one who uh, introduced uh, Paul Cézanne uh, to the market and all these people. So let's go to the next one. So back to our painting. Now, after our trajectory, I hope you see the glow. <laughs> Um, um, you do see the compartmentalization. You also understand that, uh, uh, at least uh, from a certain perspective, one uh, can look at this painting as a flat surface with uh, more or less harmoniously, I think highly harmoniously, arranged lines uh, and color. And in addition to that, we have this Japanistic uh, uh, interest in, in shifting between the illusion of space and the flatness uh, of uh, the surface. A very important element is, however, lacking, and I'm giving you that element now. And I'm sure you're not surprised at all. Here we go. Pointillism. Pointillisme. So it's another isme and another manifesto that was written at one point by some laborious artist. In that case, it was actually a critic. Um, uh, and published, and everybody was looking at it. And so the painting that you see on the left-hand side is La Grande Jatte. Um, uh, it's in Argenteuil, it's a, it's a suburb of uh, Paris, and it's people, um, so it's this notion of the weekend, uh, where uh, people who are working during the week, which is a modern uh, concept, to go out for the weekend to, to, to relax. Um, and this painting is one of the absolute masterpieces uh, in the collection of uh, the Art Institute in Chicago. So, for that painting already, it's worth going to Chicago. There are also some skyscrapers, but that painting is really important. So um, when you look at, and, and unfortunately, I couldn't get it to scale, the way the pointillé, the little dots, are uh, placed on that surface. Um, so what you see bottom left is something that you cannot see on that reproduction, which is basically that part. Okay, so what Seurat did uh, was he uh, created a frame in the frame, um, and the painting is actually covered with this almost this skin of little dots, uh, and dots in, a, uh, uh, in, 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 in many variations. So it's not just the round dot, it's also the, the comma dot, and it's the stroke dot. Um, and all this covers the surface. Um, 
So I just give you a, a, a cutout, which I showed you at the very beginning on the, on the right-hand side of, of Bonas. Um, so you have these shapes, and then you have these dots in there. So they, these guys, they looked so much uh, at Seurat's art and tried to make out of that something that is definitely not impressionist, um, but that does something else, that creates this vibration, this tingling uh, for, for the eye. Um, so I give you some more examples of that fabulous tingling. Here we go. So on the left, this is probably somewhere um, uh, where, the, where the sea meets the, uh, uh, the, 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 the green. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see a similar pointillé, um, which is basically the pebbles uh, in, the, in the Bonnard painting. Um, so when you get close to that painting in, in Chicago, you just see everywhere completely different patterns, not only of, of, of dots, sizes, and so on, but you also see different color combinations. And one of the most alluring ones is actually here. And I don't know whether it comes across on the, uh, um, uh, on, on the reproduction, but um, you have this pink together with green. I mean, that's outrageous. I don't know that many people who would combine that again in clothes. Um, but you get this glow and you get this tingling uh, uh, for, for, for your eyes. It's, it's an absolute feast uh, for the eye uh, that uh, Sora is uh, creating there. To rinse your palettes, we just go back to, to uh, our, our dear uh, Bonnard. We have the pebbles in the garden as, as uh, small dots. We have uh, the dots on this uh, wicker suitcase. I couldn't identify what that is that holds the door. Uh, these, these smaller dots. And then you have dots that get bigger. So you have the dots on the curtain that get, get into big splashes. Um, then you have the leaves in the garden. You can see them as dots too. Um, and then you have the clouds. They are gigantic dots, if you will. And then you have the dots that disappear because they get so big, such as the table. It's a, it's a huge dot. Uh, and yet, uh, it is just a, a flat surface in uh, one color. Um, so, um, placed in our holdings of uh, 19th century uh, art, uh, we are actually incredibly fortunate because we have all the key works that back this painting up, that make that journey that I just did with you via uh, paintings, no less than the Musée d'Orsay. I wish we had it, but we don't. So, um, and... Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll show you what we have that, that backs this up. So this is our, it's a late uh, uh, Monet, uh, it's Waterloo Bridge. Um, and uh, Waterloo Bridge, you can look at it almost like a flag uh, in, in, in terms of brushwork. So you have these kind of, kind of lines like this, like waves down here. Then you have a different, um, it's, it's big lines, it's, it's just the opposite of those, these big lines here. Then you have lots of dots on top, and then you have verticals and horizontals, and then at the very top you have just little, little swirls. But again, it is a highly contained, so the subject, um, London Bridge, I mean London as we all know, has lots of smog, lots of fog, uh, so uh, uh, all shapes disappear. So how do you capture this? Well, you capture that by having a highly compartmentalized way of, of brushwork. Um, so that we have, and it's, uh, it's exactly next to that painting, uh, as you will see when you go to the gallery. Then, um, and that's only up since a couple of days, uh, we have a work by, um, by our friend Louis Anquetin, and it is uh, Femme aux oiseaux, so lady with, um, uh, with birds, um, and when you think again about that phrase, when you look through the blue of the blue shard, what you see is winter. So this lady is Mrs. Winter, and everything is dead. She's wearing um, the clothes of dead animals. Her hat is ornated with dead birds, probably the, the, the pigeons, the American pigeons that at one point went extinct, uh, because they all ended up on, on hats. Uh, so... Um, uh, and then when you look at her skin, the skin is, um, uh, is pale and bluish, no life anymore. You almost may imagine that the lips are lifeless. It's truly Mrs. Winter. Um, and she looks almost like a Medusa 
The very moment she turns at us, she may petrify us because she looks so horrifying. And these people were obsessed with women and obsessed with women that would uh, make men's life more difficult. <laughs> so, um, uh, and at that same time, you have uh, Charcot, who was uh, uh, the teacher of um, uh, uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, dealing with um, uh, hysteria, which was a very male invention. So whatever was difficult was hysteria. Um, and uh, so he paints this femme fatale who is as cold as ice, uh, but there is a glow, and that glow is in the hair. And when you see the pastel uh, 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 in the flesh, you'll see that even more. Just look at this red-brown here and there, and it really pops. So it is that glow that the Impressionists did not get, we're not interested in probably, but that these people are after. A glow and a color that's completely captivating you, and um, that actually, as colors sometimes do, put you in an emotional state. Uh, so he gives us this coldness and this emotional state of coldness, and it gets even colder because you have a little bit of that glowing uh, brown-red of life uh, in it. Here she is again in all her splendor. So when you see the, the Bonnard, you absolutely have to go and have a look at that. And then we have, uh, and unfortunately the reproduction is, I, I know I should not say unfortunately, which is the truth, um, it is purposefully bad because I want you to see the painting uh, in that gallery. Uh, so that is Odilon Redon. Odilon Redon was one of the people that you saw on that painting with all the Nabi. Uh, all the friends of, of Pierre Bonnard. Um, uh, and that painting um, uh, represents spring and has these flowering colors. It's almost like, uh, I've never taken drugs, but I imagine when you take them, it's kind of this kind of psychedelic thing that you, uh, so blues go, go to you and so on and so forth. So um, uh, it's this kind of, it's almost a pop dream as well, no? Again, 1970s, although painted much, much earlier. Uh, so we even have uh, one of the members of that circle of friends of the Nabi in our collection. And then we have another masterpiece in our collection, which goes much farther. Uh, well, that one, of course. So that is uh, uh, The Brooding Woman from uh, uh, 1891. Uh, by Gauguin, which is one of our Mona Lisas uh, uh, in our museum, uh, where you have this Japanese principle. Um, you don't know, is it depth or is it flatness that you see? Um, uh, it's also the color that produces something like a, a color perspective. It's these very outrageous color combinations uh, that you have in that painting um, that the Impressionists never, never cultivated. It's um, another form of compartmentalization of uh, the flat surface. Um, it is, you can read it in a, um, uh, in a highly formalistic way, um, so it's colors and lines arranged in a certain way, and you can also read it in a projectory way, and we come to that subject in my uh, conclusion. Um, and then we have our pointillist moment, um, and it's actually, uh, so it's Paul Signac, it's not uh, the master himself, it's not Seurat, but it looks almost like a, um, so it's a, it's a later one as well. Uh, it, it almost looks like a, a, a blown up detail from one of the uh, uh, Seurat paintings because you, you can identify uh, those dots uh, very, very easily. Whereas when you look at a, a big uh, Seurat painting, you just see something on the surface that's, that's tingling, but you, you don't identify unless you get very close. You don't identify these, these dots together. Here you do see that, and he makes that this kind of, uh, um, aesthetic principle that the whole world is just uh, divided into, into those dots. Um, and this is our piece de resistance. So um, this is by Braque, and it is uh, um, uh, Les Oliviers, so it's the olive trees, um, and it is one of the most important uh, Fauvist uh, paintings that there are. So now we don't speak anymore about um, compartmentalization, Everything turns into color. It's, it's just an orgy of color. There's almost no discipline anymore, hence the fauve, the wild beasts. Um, this was a big scandal, but so many scandals happened one after the other. So, um, uh, And um, uh, it's all about colors. It's all about this glow of the colors and this, uh, this shocking neighborhood. I mean, just think about this, um, this violet, for instance, together with that uh, blue-green 
uh, or the olive at the, uh, at the top. Um, so this is basically both a summing up of what happened before uh, with the Nabi, um, with uh, uh, Paul Gauguin, uh, with uh, Anquetin and the Impressionists, and it's the next way forward. So it's this kind of hinge work. I mean, everything is a hinge for something else, but uh, it's, it's really summing up and leading to something completely new. Um, I hope you don't get tired of my pointing all the time to that painting, but it's so beautiful. So um, you can look at all of this uh, in a very formalistic way. And what characterizes French art of the uh, end of the uh, 19th century um, is that there's a very strong formalistic attention. And of course, the very moment you get into those uh, waters of uh, uh, formalism, uh, you, um, you are also exposed to this very tedious question of content and form. And of course, these two, they go together. So um, you could say on the one hand, the very moment you just look at the form, the content comes by the back door. Now we have a back door. Um, but what would that be? So, and that was a conundrum for these guys. So there are people like Seurat who came up, and every, every year he came up with a new idea, uh, of defining uh, the symbolistic meaning of his technical tools. So he talked about an ascending and a descending line, which that would uh, express. Uh, in terms of optimism and pessimism. Uh, there was a lot of um, uh, color psychology going on, so that via the form you, you give something subliminal, actually, kind of convey a subliminal meaning, whatever meaning is. Um, uh, there are uh, people uh, who uh, think about uh, uh, this as a kind of bourgeois escape. Um, and again, the clients were there to escape with, uh, with Bonnard. Uh, if you think about uh, Gauguin, uh, it's an escape into exoticism, uh, into a world that is not polluted by uh, the um, industrial uh, achievements and by the city. Um, and it's coming back to a not specified foundational meaning, fundamental meaning, something in the guts maybe. Um, I think ultimately it boils down to if that painting at least for me, um, if that painting touches me and I don't think about it then anymore in formal uh, ways or in content ways, there is something that touches me. And what I hope to do with this uh, short presentation is to give you some tools to look at painting of the end of the 19th century. Um, and if I was successful, that painting touches you a little bit as well um, and makes you enjoy the Worcester Art Museum a little bit more and makes you want to go to the gallery where this, uh, this painting is, along with the Monet, uh, along with the Odile Rodon, uh, uh, and along with all the other companions. And you'll realize we have a mighty fine collection. Thank you very much. You didn't mention the term expressionism. Is that not a legitimate term? Expressionism, that comes later. So uh, that's... that's uh, my, my, my German fellow countrymen. Uh, it's legitimate in the sense that one critic at one point said this is expressionism, in the same way that somebody at one point said this is impressionism. So all these isms, it's, it's really fascinating. So you have all these isms together with, in politics, Marxism, socialism, and all this. So you have all these ideologies, um, and the artist tried to, to, to follow this kind of ideology, this manifesto uh, 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 thing. Um, probably because they thought by having a manifesto of themselves they could make a dent. Uh, they could attract people who would buy their art. Looking at the door with the reflection on the glass and how that touches you, whereas all these dots of stylization throughout the picture, do you think Bernard was worried with that reflection on the window or how do you interpret that? <laughs> um, it's always difficult because we all project um, talking about projections, but we all project. So um, I can't really tell you what Bonnard thought about this, but I think what is always productive, and that's why I always love to look with lots of people at a painting, when we all say what we see and what strikes us the most, and then just figure out um, 
could that make sense in a bigger interpretation? But in this case, I can't help you. Um, but this is not the problem. I think um, you should just look at the painting. Maybe when we have time, I look at it with you. And, and we try to see how it fits in for us. But the whole thing is so much about uh, a subjective perception. It's about that. So there is no such thing as, as objectivity. I mean, um, when you take old master paintings, of course you also have subjectivity. But the question is, is the subject done in an innovative way? Or things like that. In this case, I mean, this is, the subject is a pretext for something else. It's a pretext to get you in, in, a, in a kind of subliminal way. Um, and if they're good, they get you. And if they're bad, it's just lousy. So, and there are lots of, and the, the interesting thing is, I mean, uh, um, time always takes a lot of uh, bad art production uh, off the shelf. But um, the, what is fascinating in that time is you have a lot of people who are extremely mediocre, extremely mediocre. And even um, uh, uh, Louis Anquetin, for instance, he had this nanosecond where he was great, and all the rest is absolutely rubbish. It is so bad. So he, he tried to resurrect Rubens. And when you look at these paintings, you think, what was on his mind? Um, uh, Emile Bernard, uh, the, 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 the gentleman whom I, I uh, mentioned, who was uh, very important for, for Paul Gauguin, he also had just a nanosecond. And then thereafter, he went into complete, because there was nothing he, he couldn't create anymore. And so somebody like Bonnard is consistently good. He continues to, although he's no more innovative in that sense, but he has this kind of toolkit of dots and, and uh, uh, vibrant colors and things like that. And he fashions every time, every painting, he fashions something new that is absolutely riveting for those who are so inclined. Um, uh, Gauguin is the same case. And then most of the other people of that same generation, they are, they're nothing. They just have one moment, one blip. Thank you, Matthias. Okay, thank you. Within this drama and the action and the uh, uh, scene of the flagellation, this sitting back and observing uh, the image of the uh, man of sorrows, the king with a crown of thorns.